Hello, I'm Neil Ferguson, uh, the Millbank Family Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution and Chair of the Hoover History Working Group. Uh, it's our pleasure this week to welcome uh, to our regular seminar, uh, Bob Zelik, the 11th President of the World Bank from 2007 to 2012. Before that, U.S. Deputy Secretary of State, and before that, U.S. Trade Representative from 2001 till 2005. Uh, Bob Zelik had an illustrious career in government service uh, with jobs at both the Department of Treasury and the State Department under Presidents Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush. But his first love was history, because that's the subject he studied at, at Swarthmore as an undergraduate, and it's the subject he's returned to with his new book just published last year, America in the World, A History of U.S. Diplomacy and Foreign Policy. Uh, Bob, it's a pleasure to welcome you uh, virtually to Hoover, and it was a pleasure to read and review your book. And I wanted to uh, begin by asking you a little bit about uh, your own experience in government service, particularly at, uh, at the State Department, did you actually find yourself thinking about historical analogies or precedents when you were in the room where it happens? Because I sometimes suspect that in truth, much as we like to talk about applying history, when you're actually there taking decisions in real time, you don't have time to think that much about historical analogies. Am I wrong about that? Um, well, I actually, in my case, I can't speak for others. Uh, yeah, that would be wrong <laughs> because you, you don't wipe your mind uh, clean of, of the context of which you're thinking about a problem. But so uh, to give you some practical examples, um, when we had the opportunity to first have a free trade agreement with Canada and then with Mexico for, for NAFTA. It was very much in my mind about overcoming the divisions of the North American continent, and not only the tensions with Canada where we struggled for such an agreement for over a century, but even more, of course, with Mexico where we've taken a third of the territory. And this was a, a, a total uh, reversal of sort of the past tensions between the two parties. Um, in the case of German uh, unification, as we've discussed elsewhere, we had a strategic view about not only supporting uh, Germany's democracy as an ally, but embedding unification within NATO and the Western, the, the European Union institutions and in dealing with the future stability and security of the European space. Um, if I think about trade policy, when I was moving forward uh, trying to restart trade negotiations in 2001, and we were uh, trying to work at a global level through the WTO, I also used bilateral free trade agreements to try to advance the agenda, which is exactly what Cordell Hull did in the, in the 30s, which led to the GATT process. So I think you use the term analogy. And while people often think in analogies, my own experience is you have to be careful that they can also mislead you. I tend to find the historical perspective helpful in thinking about questions to ask, to be sensitive about. And also, frankly, understanding how other people view their history. You have a great quote in the book from The Spectator exactly 100 years ago. The American nation has a dual personality. Americans are at once the most idealist and the most practical people in the world. They vibrate between Emerson and Edison. And I thought this is almost uh, the encapsulation of your argument. This is a a book that, that celebrates the full sweep of American diplomatic history of American statecraft since, since the founding. But the heroes, it seems to me, are, are the people who kind of combine uh, Emerson and, and Edison, who, who have an idealism. Uh, that, that's certainly a theme, but, but they're practical. They, they get things done. And I really enjoyed the fact that you gave almost equal billing to the first half of the American story and, and, and as to the second half. Talk a little bit about what you learned new uh, when you were writing about the, the first phase of American diplomatic history, because I don't think anybody writes a book and doesn't learn stuff in, in, in doing so. What were the things about, let's say, the, the 19th century 
history of American diplomacy that were unfamiliar and, and yet somehow strengthened the argument you wanted to make? Well, I'm glad you asked that because I, frankly, I love the 19th century figures and, and the issues they dealt with. Um, and it starts with a, an important issue for the United States today. You know, sometimes people are used to the idea of whether they use the term hegemon or primacy. The United States had to conduct diplomacy uh, when it didn't have total dominance. And in fact, sometimes had quite a weak hand. Um, and there was quite a skill deployed in that. So it, it starts with Ben Franklin. Uh, so I, I open with, uh, with Franklin uh, in Paris during the course of the revolution. And it's, it's a wonderful tale of his adroit diplomacy, dealing with an ally in France, trying to have peace negotiations with Britain while also trying to have a reconciliation uh, going beyond for a longer term arrangement dealing with quarrelsome and difficult uh, sort of colleagues, having a sense of timing uh, for, for when to move on issues. Um, and there's some wonderful accounts about even after Congress, for example, has directed the American negotiators to, to in a sense, line up with France, the, the negotiators decide to go ahead and cut a deal with Britain that serves their advantage. And then Franklin has to get another loan from France. And so his, his letter in doing so is quite sort of artful. Um, but then there are other people. So with, uh, with Alexander Hamilton, I suppose you know, I obviously knew about his role in, in, as an economic uh, designer of America's credit and financial system. What was interesting was to get a sense of how he initially had an idea as Lord Shelburne did of Britain, who had been the first minister at the time of the peace treaty, that maybe there could be an Anglo-American partnership um, that would serve both their interests, but the politics don't provide, uh, provide it. And so he moves on to the neutrality idea in part based on the fact that he needs to have commerce go back and forth. He, doesn't, he needs to stay out of wars so as to be able to uh, have revenue to pay the debts in the future, which is at that time, the Customs revenue is about 95, 96% of the revenue sources. Um, with Thomas Jefferson and the Louisiana Purchase, you know, in a sense, the question I ask is, was he lucky or was he good? I mean, there clearly <laughs> were developments in the Napoleonic Wars, developments in Haiti and others. But as you dig into the, the practical aspects of his diplomacy, that's what the book tries to get, get into. You can see how he tried to maneuver how he did, in a sense, maybe Hamilton would have moved too quickly to a, a more military solution, how he handled the negotiations in the process. Um, and so, and he was very much helped by the team he had around them. I never really focused on the fact that, you know, Monroe is sent to, uh, to Paris to do the negotiation in part because Monroe is trusted by Westerners. So there's a political notion of this. Monroe arrives just at the time that Napoleon is ready to deal. And Monroe faces this very difficult question without transatlantic communications. He's sent to buy New Orleans and he's offered all of Louisiana, which would double the United States at a time where, remember, this is inconceivable. If it were Jefferson, he might have actually just sort of <laughs> you know, wrestled with the problem and been unable to face it. And Monroe, who was nowhere near as intelligent, but as a man of some you know, basic core decision-making, decides to run the risk of doing the deal. Um, and when the deal comes back, you have another situation because Jefferson realizes the constitution doesn't give authority for this. Of course, he's battled Hamilton about not extending constitutional authority. And Matt, and he's starting to think, well, should I have an amendment? And, and Madison says, no, 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 we're not going to wait for this. So you can have a sense of the team. So what, what I think the richness in each of these cases, or Lincoln, and, and the, the brilliance of how he manages to ward off uh, British and French intervention, yeah. civil war, in each of these cases, what you're going to see is the different skills that people apply. And I'm hoping that people can draw some of those lessons for today as well. Well, that was what I was going to say. It seems to me that there's a lot to be said for looking back at a time when the United States didn't have full spectrum dominance. Uh, when we consider the present predicament uh, of the United States, which is certainly finding its uh, its dominance challenged, 
in many ways more uh, credibly, uh, certainly in economic terms, by China than it ever was by anybody else before. And, and so I want to kind of leap forward in time uh, to your later reflections in the book and your, your current thoughts. We're, in a, we're now in a very different place, uh, uh, even from when you were finishing the book. A new admin administration is in office. It is having to make some of the big uh, decisions about the Middle East, uh, about, of course, its relationship with China, probably the most important relationship in the world these days. I'd love to get an update. If you could write another postscript or a epilogue to the epilogue, what are the thoughts in, in, in your mind? And have we got to a better place under Joe Biden than we were under Donald Trump, a president with whom you had, I think it's fair to say, little sympathy? <laughs> Well, it's early. And one of the lessons I think, you know, from, from the book is you can't decide on foreign policy in the first few months. But I would go back to the five traditions that I, I run throughout the book. So starting out is your North America policy. That's important not only for what Americans care about with narcotics or organized crime or immigration or economic relations, but it's going to be important in our strength in dealing with China or other parts of the world. Um, and there have been some initial uh, sort of openings to that relationship. I'm a little worried. It, it, we'll have to see on the implementation. And this is where practice will matter. The, the USMCA, the rewrite of NAFTA, has rather extensive labor provisions that could be used to help build Mexican labor unions, or they could be used for protectionism. Um, if I were going to do, as opposed to a Buy America, why not do a Buy North America, which would help all the different parties? Um, another tradition was trade, transnationalism, and technology. Um, and what I and underscore in this is how trade in U.S. relations was more than a matter of economic efficiency. It's a key part of our partnerships. As you know, as an economic historian, this was part of the story of the post-World War II period. This is an area where I'm a little worried the Biden administration is going to try to practice multilateralism without trade. And I, I think they're going to run into difficulty with that. Um, and... On the technology dimension, um, there's a critical aspect that I think they're focusing on to strengthen America's foundations for technology. That could be an important part going uh, to the future. But we also have to operate in a larger world. So this will be negotiating the standards and, and the rules for data and other issues. Brings you right back to international negotiations. Alliances and order is another tradition. The United States avoids alliances for 150 years. Then we create a unique alliance system. I think the uh, administration is starting to uh, restore some of the, the, the strength and confidence of that with both Europe and Asia. Um, but again, I don't think that they can just detach that from some of their economic relations with some of these key parties. You know, And their China policy will have to take into account the fact that China or Japan, South Korea, India, Australia, ASEAN, they're not going to want to totally detach from the Chinese economy. So how do you pursue those issues? I think the administration is actually quite wise in using some of the, the what I'll call the new security issues, climate, biological security, others, as part of their alliance relations. But of course, you can't ignore the traditional hard security aspects. Then another tradition is public support and congressional support. And you know, here what's interesting is the, American, the polls suggest the American public has, understands America's role in the world, but it's an inchoate sense. So how will you catalyze that? And here it's partly explanations, but as you know, as a historian, Neil, it's partly events. You know, it's, it's that famous Macmillan quote about you know, events, dear boy, events driving uh, plans. So the reality is any administration will partly be response to you know, what, how it deals with the Iran issue or North Korea issue or some other challenge. And finally, I talk about sort of America's purpose in the world. And I note how this changes over time, whether it's freedom or small R republics or human rights, that's clearly a big part of this administration's policy. We'll have to see how they also integrate that with the other interests that the United States has whether on security, economic side. So um, I think the, the one other point I'd mention is not surprisingly, 
President Biden has his top priority has to be to deal with the pandemic and economic recovery. So uh, my former boss Baker, when he was chief of staff to Reagan in 1981, said, "Mr. President, you have three priorities: economic recovery, economic recovery, and economic recovery." So that will determine Biden's success over the next two years. They're now piling on a series of other sort of domestic issues. And the question will be, as they do that, um, will they overload the system? Uh, will in some ways, will they overshoot? Uh, will they sort of create other economic problems? And how will they use these as part of their larger international posture? And those are the questions we should watch. Well, one of the things I really enjoyed about this book was that uh, it, it wasn't always the secretaries of state, or for that matter, the presidents who were center stage. You uh, give some great uh, accounts of the, the lesser figures, the less famous names. Will Clayton, the Tennessee-born cotton king, who was key in making the Marshall Plan actually happen. Vannevar Bush, People have heard of him. I certainly had, but I really learned a lot from your discussion of his contributions as, a, as an engineer to U.S. Uh, technological leadership in the, in the Cold War. And Major General William Tunner, I mean, we might find ourselves with an airlift to Taiwan at some point in the next uh, few years if things get ugly. I hope there's somebody uh, like him to make sure that actually works. And this was, for me, one of the really important takeaways uh, from your book. Pragmatism is not just seeing how to get things done, it's making sure they do get done. And your book's unusual, I think, in focusing on the kind of delivery piece, uh, which is something that I, I think I associate with, with your own career at both, uh, both Treasury and State. So uh, to everybody uh, who is uh, watching this short interview, I very much uh, encourage you to get hold of America and the World, a History of U.S. Diplomacy and Foreign Policy. It's much, much more than that. Uh, in a way, it's a history of uh, economic statecraft. Uh, and uh, best of all, it's a history that takes us right back to the origins of the Republic and gives due credit to the people who don't quite make it into the headlines. Uh, Bob Zillick, thanks so much for joining us at the Hoover History Working Group, and uh, may your book sell many copies. Thank you, Neil. It's fun talking to you.